also change movements in our American and African American history. Tonight, Mr. Steele will illuminate the true 60s spirit and youthful intelligentsia of the Black Panther Party, a formatic, unknown philosophical range of the 60s protest movements, which grew out of the student activism, historical class analysis, scientific research, and pro programmatic <laughs> grassroots community organizing. Uh, Mr. Steele transports the audience back to the mini Civil War turbulence, the late 60s and early 70s, a time when the activism of 100,000 of protesters of many different ethnic groups created coalitions, which included young black men and women selling hundreds of thousands of the Black Panther Weekly newspaper. He also created numerous community programs and registered thousands to vote, complete with law books in their hands and legal guns handy for self-defense against racist and fascist police. Defining himself as a revolutionary humanist, Seal brings up the Black Panther Party 60s protest movements, era full circle, showing that times have changed. How we must reach for the future, demonstrate protests, organize real people's programs, and evolve a greater direct community controlled democracy, void of racist, bigoted, and chauvinistic practices. So please welcome Bobby Seal. Jasper, Texas, 
And uh, as a kid, I knew about this. I knew my father was a big time master carpenter and builder. So I was very lucky to grow up a carpenter and a builder and an architect, you know, a top flight architect for my, a lot of flight layouts for my father, adding dens and rooms and stuff, you know, went through license and inspection right downtown city government of Oakland, California at age 15. So that's where I was, you know, and then the United States Air Force, et cetera. So I was lucky to have these skills and traits, what have you and then being an engineer and design major. But in that period, I became very interested in my African people's history, black American people's history. Mm -hmm. You know, and I began to read a lot. One of the first books I read, it was Jomo Kenyatta's Facing Mount Kenya. And I read that book, I took it to work with me, out at Kaiser Aerospace Electronics and in between inspecting engine frames. I sit down at my desk and start reading this book. And I discovered this black man who left his people, the Kikuyu people, in Kenya. Went to England and got a couple of degrees, came to America, got a degree. Went back somewhat of an anthropologist, but he became, you know, part and parcel of trying to organize his people out from under the yoke of English colonialism over there people in, in, in Kenya. Yes. And I was shocked to find out. I knew nothing about Africa until I read that book. You know, I, I, my, my, yeah, I got A's in mathematics and I could apply the quadratic formula, et cetera, blah, 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 but I knew nothing about my African, African American people's history of struggle. Mm. And here I was beginning to learn something, you know. And uh, next thing I know, I'm trying to digest W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. <laughs> and then when the process of doing that, wow, I discovered, whoa, what happened here? This man is saying that we injected ourselves into the Civil War in this country. And we ejected, oh my God, we wound up right after the Emancipation Proclamation after prayer. Abraham Lincoln had stated that this were ever poor free. The very next line said, we'll take all able-bodied black men into the Northern Union Army, blah, blah, blah. And two years later, bang, what's happened? They won the war. And Abraham Lincoln said, if it had not been for the black man, etc., would not have won the war. You see, and what was happening here is I'm witnessing, I says, I didn't know this even existed. This that was, what? Then I'm reading Frederick Douglass. Uh, I'm finding out all kinds of stuff there. I'm finding out in Black Reconstruction, there were some black congressmen at the time, right in the Reconstruction period. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Bro, this is the stuff that inspired me to really get involved, you know. Marvel J. Herskovitz, I read his book, Myth of the Negro Press, a great mm -hmm. dissertative work, I'm telling you. It blew my mind, and he came across a period that we was talking about surviving Africans in the black language, and he was quoting a man named Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner had did 12 years of field research all from down the, the coast of Africa from Senegal to Angola, and he was documenting surviving Africans of the black language in America, particularly the Africans who spoke English, and then he came to the Caribbean and the islands, etc., and did the same thing. He came right back to America, to the Gullah Islands, off the coast of North and South Carolina, and then when he came in and found this rich surviving framework of African languages, idioms, etc., and so this blew my mind. Then he even found a few surviving African words. And this stuff blew my mind. wait a minute. Then I found out why we said this, that, Jim, yo, mo, and po. Why black folks tended to drop the T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds. Mm. Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. This is an African-American brother. His name was Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. He did 12 years of field research to write a book dealing with surviving Africans in the black language. I talk about this because it, even though I love all my anthropology classes, this was more concrete in terms of connecting my very culture, my very existence with Africa, etc. This is where it came from. You know, and I read it and I found, I said, wow. He said, this, that, them, yo, mo, and fo. I did it too. Even though in tech school, etc., I struggled with all my technical language because it's very important to be precise in your technical language. But in everyday life, in everyday colloquial speaking, etc., yeah, bro, what's happening? You know what it is, man. You know what that <laughs> Dropping T-H-E-R-A-R, rolling our sounds. You know, old lady in our house. Timberly, Timberly, get up in this house. Get up in this house. Shut that door. And clean this mess up off that floor. You hear me? Get in here. She said, clean this mess up off that floor. <laughs> get in this house. You know, this, that, them, yo, mo, and fo, rather than this, that, them, your, mo, and fo, the dropping of, there were no T-H-E-R-A-R, rolling our sounds in the West African language where we were extracted from. And this is what my philosophy, and this is what showed me. It was not about being inferior. 
Right. Because the old eugenics boys up in England, these races there, the founders of anthropology, <laughs> of the very research and empirical evidence in anthropology, proved these founders a bunch of racist supremacists. This is, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I was into, evolving in college, you know, working, etc. That shifted me, you know, and made me understand something, you know, uh, a lot of stuff. So much reading. Digesting, uh, digesting Dr. Herbert Athacker's work of 250 slave revolts. This man documented 250 slave revolts from the year 1800 to 1857. And what he documented is 250 slave revolts, he says, involved 10 or more slaves. He went on to explain that there were all other kinds of revolts going on with less than 10 slaves that he's not necessarily documenting here, but it was there. And what he was trying to say, there was a high level of resistance and many levels of concern to slavery. Mm -hmm. What they had taught us is to remove that history, and, and, and we believe all well, black folks are just docile and blah, blah, bull crap. People mm -hmm. resisted in yeah. slavery in one, in one way, shape, fashion, form, or another. Now, the most prominent slave revolt was Gabriel Post in 1800, 1822 was Denmark Vesey, 1831 was Matt Turner and others. Those are the most prominently well known. But this is another book, Work I Digest. And Dr. Herbert Athacker had done another work dealing with all the wars African American people, black people had fought in in the United States of America right on up to that time of the early 1960s. And this, this, these are the things and the works and the research part of the, the works and research that, he, that, that make, involved me to a point, you know. I mean, in the middle of this in 1962, the next thing I know, I ran down to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak at the Oakland Auditorium. 7,000 people, 7,000 seats there, every seat was taken. I was a young student, you know, still had my job as Gemini, on the Gemini Missile Program, what have you, so, but I went to hear this brother speak.